Okay, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, so this is going to be a fun session. Uh, lots of energy. This is an AMA, so ask me anything and ask everybody anything. So um, this is really as much your stage as it is uh, our stage. So we're going to start off quickly just by getting to know everybody. You got a brief intro, but uh, we want to know exactly. And from the angle, who are you? What is your company about? And where are you at in terms of fundraising? What did you raise or what are you about to raise so that we can know where everybody sits? Um, so I will start with Elizabeth. Howdy, everybody. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Gore. I'm the president and chairwoman of Alice. Uh, we are a machine learning software that helps small and medium businesses launch and scale their, scale their companies. So anyone can go to helloos.com and get the connection uh, to anything they need to succeed. So think of us as Siri uh, for business owners. So they can ask Alice, I need an accountant, I need funding, I need a connection, I need a mentor. Uh, but what's super unique about Alice is we figured out how to use algorithms to ensure that women, people of color, uh, veterans, people with disabilities have the ability to access those resources equally, which is really exciting. Uh, we're based in California, but we're global. We're helping about 70,000 owners a week right now. Our goal is to get to 4 million a week. Um, so we went through a seed round. Uh, priced round, and we also uh, were, were Jedis on finding non-dilutive capital. So uh, we applied for government grants all over the world, and um, science grants, and then now we're in our in the middle of our Series A. So if any of you are wondering, we got three no's today, if you're wondering how this works, uh, you're nodding your head. And, um, but we also got a yes on a grant, so there's uh, back and forth, so it's awesome to meet all of you. Okay, uh, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Kunze. I run Pandora Bots. It's the largest chatbot development and hosting platform in the world. Uh, by the numbers, we have about a quarter million registered developers. Um, I'm here to represent the bootstrapping perspective. We actually grew out of an open source hobby project organically over a very slow period of time. Um, and we were able to be self-funding on revenue. Uh, I'm Craig Bunton, um, yes, former Olympic athlete, um, co-founder, CEO of SportLogic. Uh, we are a team of uh, 12 PhDs, um, eight university labs across five universities. Uh, we've built a set of technologies that can take broadcast sport footage, um, generate hundreds of millions of data points, and can effectively see, understand, and describe the game in real time. Um, so we've, we've basically built a, um, yeah, a, a an AI coach. Awesome. And in terms of uh, fundraising? Fundraising, we were actually quite uniquely, we, we had to raise money very early on. Uh, the concept came before sort of AI was really a, a thing. And um, we invested um, really, really from starting with, with initial grants uh, in university research four years ago. Uh, we've now gone through three financing rounds. Uh, we're pretty close to making a uh, large announcement uh, on, our, on our Series B. Awesome. So that's a really good uh, spectrum we have. We have bootstrapped. We have uh, uh, doing a, a, a seed and Series A round. And then we have a more seasoned uh, investor who's already gone through a few rounds. So I think you're going to have uh, good expertise depending on where you are on the continuum to ask about today. Um, and uh, just I'll go back just about myself. So I'm, um, I'm uh, one of the people who was there right at the beginning with Element AI when we launched uh, about uh, 19, 19 months ago. So it's been a crazy ride. Um, and prior to that, when I had uh, my own startup, it's funny because we didn't call it fundraising then. We called it writing a good business plan and going to see a bank and getting a small business loan. Now I know, now it's called fundraising. Um, but, but then it was the same thing. Um, and uh, when it was time to get more uh, fundraising, uh, it wasn't a VC route, it was a more traditional route. So it's interesting to see where it's come, and sometimes I think, hmm, if I knew then what I know now, uh, I may have taken some different, uh, some different steps. So before we get into the questions, I wanted to reach out to each one of you and just ask, when you started looking for money or thinking, hmm, I'm going to need some money to grow this or start this, um, what was it along the way that surprised you the most or that you were the least prepared for? Uh, Elizabeth? Oh, man, uh, everything. 
I was surprised for everything, and I thought I was prepared, but wasn't. Um, so time, probably for me, was the number one issue. I was shocked at the amount of time it took, uh, not actually the length of time to raise, but my personal time. So as president of the company, um, it was, while, it, while I have a great team, investors only wanted to meet with me, um, talk to me on the phone, schedule with me, um, and then the follow-up was so personal in terms of the questions I heard and so on. So, and I'm back in it again. So I feel like I had two full-time jobs running the company and going after financing. So um, I always tell founders, when you're going into raising, ensure you have a team around me that can keep the day-to-day -day operations of the business running. Um, so that, that's what I was least prepared for, was, was the time piece. Yeah, I manage it especially when you get to the legal parts with LOIs and all that kind of stuff, which can be incredibly time consuming. Yeah, so I, I should note, um, we, I did meet, I meet with investors about once a month. Um, they ping me frequently because, um, you know, they know our numbers. Um, and I did try to raise money um, in 2014, actually in 2015. So we, we um, initially funded on large consulting services contracts. Um, it's actually a really great way to make sure that you're solving a real client problem. Um, but we had, we had no recurring revenue. So when I initially met with investors, I kind of met with all the big guys on Sand Hill Road. Um, you know, they're like, you look like a services company, come back when you hit X, Y, and Z in terms of MRR. Um, so yeah, it does, it does take a lot of time. Um, and then we actually, we probably could have taken a few million dollars at the time, um, but we started having acquisition conversations, so I've been through that process. Um, and just, I guess, don't let people waste your time. Like, you can set your own rules with VCs or potential buyers, um, but that was my first time going through it, so I made a lot of mistakes, and I, we did have a lot of time wasted. But at the end of that process, we were in the, we had hit the MRR benchmarks that VCs had wanted, but at that point, we didn't need the money. So that's the best way. And Craig, uh, so you had uh, funding at the beginning from, from grants and university funding for research, but when you wanted to actually scale out and commercialize, uh, what was it that surprised you the most? Well, I process? think actually maybe just, just tailing on that. Um, so I, I actually did have prior to Sport Logic, a small consumer packaged goods company that I bootstrapped and built and you know reinvested profit to grow. So what surprised me with this was the irrationality of, of fundraising. I mean, the going out, we, we came together, we built a logical plan. Like here is, we're gonna, this is our product, this is our plan, this is our sale, here are our customers, and we started executing. And it was like, great, we're, this thing is moving, and we went out to raise money. And it almost didn't matter. It was like the only thing that actually mattered in the fundraising was what the grand vision of what we were doing was and, and how big is that opportunity and how world changing is this technology and that was the only thing that actually drove the valuation uh, and it was really surprising to me because I was like of course that vision's there but forget about that for a second look at how we're actually executing as a company and when you're like pre 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 seed and you're investing in research executing as a company is is actually for us it kind of went against us um, so actually having rational drivers early on um, didn't move the needle. It was more about the vision for where we were going. And that kind of took me, I had to reset my thinking in, in those early days. Yeah, I, I want to piggyback on that because... Nice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. So I was um, at a very large fund on Sand Hill Road and they told me, they're like, so they'd call me back in second meeting and then they're like, you know what? We think that your company is a 200 or $300 million company and that's where you're gonna, and I was like, yay, that, that's a lot of money. They're like, but that's where you're gonna max out and unfortunately, we only invest in $30 billion companies. Good news, we're 40 billion. <laughs> and yeah, and I was like, I was like, Three billion? It's like, no, 30. And I was like, oh, cool. How many $30 billion companies in your portfolio today? And he goes, well, we have to believe that it's going to be 30 billion. So it's hard, like, it can actually hurt you to have customers and have revenue. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess it, it doesn't really hurt you because if you go for a sky high valuation, you have to prove, you have to justify it somehow. So you're going to get screwed in the end. Did um, did you find that that was consistent across various investors, or did you find you had some that had different uh, philosophies on how they choose who they're going to invest in? 
Were so, there some that had the more more aligned thinking with uh, with you? Yeah, so I mean, we yes, we got grants and all that, but we actually came from Tandem Launch, an incubator here, and, and, and these guys were with us, like, you know, seeing us actually executing. And these guys, the vision for them was just one part of the, the pitch. They, they were in because they saw us actually figure out to, how to find solutions to make customers happy, and that was the thing that they, they you know, invested in. And this is the thing that, I mean, we're still alive now. It's been, you know, three years and growing and, and, you know, because we execute. So the irony behind those early days is that, yes, sure, we had the vision, but it was the actual execution and it was the people who were the closest to the company that respected and invested in us for that. Okay, I want to make sure that the audience has uh, ample time to ask their questions. So there is a uh, microphone over there and over there. So you guys can stand up and ask your questions. Do you guys have any burning questions for these uh, seasoned fundraisers? One at a time, guys. Yeah. One at a time. <laughs> there you go. Hi there. Um, I have a question. A lot of times, um, or I guess the way we're approaching building our AI-based company is really around uh, the product that our customers use and that helps us generate a lot of that data and then the actual data and making sure that we have a data set that is unique and valuable and I think Sometimes it's hard to talk about both of those things for investors. So you have that SaaS model, and like you're saying, the revenue can kind of hurt you sometimes. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about, as an AI company, how do you articulate what you're building when it comes to the value of the data um, that you're acquiring and the machine learning that you're doing on it? Thanks. Um, so I'm literally in that position right now. Um, raising our A. So we have, um, you know, Alice is an incredibly consumer facing brand, and we have to make sure that our business owners every single day see value. But our long term monetization plan is around our data. And um, when I go in and pitch the value of both, I, it, I'm finding it really throws people off, frankly. And so, um, and I am looking for, and this is another piece of advice I was going to give everyone, we are very specifically looking for types of investors that will help us scale on both sides. Um, so I did find that I had to tailor my pitch and just, you know, if we're going into a heavy machine learning group, just make sure that we're really focusing on that piece and put, you know, consumer in the back. If someone's focused on our data, uh, push that. And so um, tailoring our pitch and then ultimately a few meetings in, Hopefully they will ask about both because one absolutely supports the other. But I think those first couple, um, ensuring knowing your audience and pitching to that audience of what they understand as simple as possible is, is important. And I certainly think was doing too much at first when you think you have 20 minutes of someone really paying attention in an hour meeting, that's all you got. Sorry, just a quick follow-up on that. In terms of evaluating investors who can help you with both, can you just speak a little bit more about what your sure. factors you're considering or looking sure. at? Sure, um, particularly in, I think, as you're in a, a later round, uh, we're trying to find folks that are not just writing us a check, but actually, if we have strategic holes in our knowledge set or in our network, um, or geography, we're actually looking for folks in specific countries too. Um, we are looking to raise not just the funding, but that knowledge capital, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, and it, it's, that, it's not that easy. I mean, you, we still have to find five in that knowledge set for one to say yes. But for example, we're looking for someone who really understands data. We're also looking for someone who, um, in three geographies. And then last, um, we're, there's a specific consumer piece of our business that I'm trying to find. So I think it's okay to really shoot for the stars sometimes and think about and beyond the check who could really help me. And it sounds like you you found some folks early on that really helped you dig in. I, I can actually just maybe on, on your first question, I think ultimately investors want to know that their their money is going into the right people, right, at this early stage. And so if, if you were, and you mentioned you're an AI company, I hear that everywhere, 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 and you very well might be, I, I have no idea, but you know, if, if you can't, if, if your executive team, and I mean across the board, or if your co-founders can't tell what a convolutional neural network is versus a generative network versus an adversarial network versus, you know, um, 
I don't know, uh, unsupervised learning versus reinforcement learning, if these are the things that you're not focusing on, I would, I would say probably what you want to do, you may not be an AI company, but you probably have AI baked into your product first approach. So if your product has, you know, AI machine learning in it and you're not the expert, focus on, you know, t talk about the vision of where it's all going. You can say, look, in three years time, all of those things are going to be commoditized. You know, the, the, the uh, you know, intellectual property that you have in AI and machine learning and all these things is going to come down so far and the barriers to entry are going to be here. And while that's happening, we're using this piece and this piece and this piece and we're focusing on these products. Your investor is going to look at you and go, I'm in good hands. I know this is the person who, who sees the big picture, right? So if you're speaking the language of your, of your investors and you're showing them like, I got this. I don't sleep because I think about this all the time and I know it and this with all of my heart, I'm in it and my, you know, if, if that's the kind of thing that, that they see from you, you're good, you know, and, and if somebody doesn't, they're probably not the right fit for you and not the other way around. I would also add, um, just start meeting with investors and hone your pitch that way. Um, I did something that's a very me thing to do, maybe kind of dumb, but you know, when I thought we needed money, I was like Googling pitch deck. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't ask anyone for help, which is something I'm working on. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, Greylock, Sequoia, Andreessen Horowitz, those are, those are the best. I'm just gonna walk in there and ask for $20 million. What could go wrong? Um, so those were actually my first meetings, and that might have been a mistake. Um, but the more you meet with investors, like they ask the same questions, they give you the same feedback, um, they poke the same holes. So if you have some investors who are friendlier or maybe not like your first choice or the like biggest ones in the valley, um, start meeting with them and just see like what story starts to resonate and I, like learn by doing. I think that would be use my them, advice. Use them as guinea pigs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's another question over there. Hi, my, my name is Herman, and uh, I'm going through a raise right now. Um, and a uh, particular question on um, how do you drive value of your valuation of the company, uh, particular determinants that you have used to your advantage, uh, especially for a data slash AI company that doesn't have the necessary, um, say, $1 million uh, ARR mark for a Series A, but still be able to be successful on it? Oof. Um, iteratively? Uh, <laughs> um, ultimately, I mean, it comes down to a few things when you're really, really early, right? There's, there's the size of the opportunity, it's, is there market interest, uh, is, the t is it the right team, and can they execute? If you can tick off those four boxes early on, uh, I don't know what stage, but I mean, I, presumably at, at sort of seed-ish, um, those are the tick boxes that if you are, A, if you're delivering it, and B, if you're adequately articulating it. Um, we, generally speaking, in any pitch I do, and I don't take advice from anybody, especially me, but um, my, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sort of say why we're the right team before I even start, so that way whatever I say next, it's like, yeah, these guys are the right guys. Um, so that kind of works for us, but ultimately those are the four tick boxes that, um, that we I always made sure early on that we were ticking off. I agree with that, and then something you said earlier, um, how unscientific this process is. Yeah, it's insane. Um, so I think you can also, as you're pitching around, ask people, what do you think it should be? Um, and, and listen to trends across, but at the, at the end of the day, once you do feel like, as a founder, this is the number that I'm confident about, it's okay to, to walk away here and there if people don't get there. Um, the other thing that I tease about is old-fashioned math, believe it or not. Um, you know, we, d we had direct costs on the time it took us to build, the amount of money, the opportunity costs, the amount of engineers we brought in, and then also um, the soft side of that being the value of our network and who is not doing this. So um, the, the unfortunate thing, there's no calculator online who just, that just nails it. So it is an iterative process, I agree. But stick to it. Don't let anyone push you around once you're confident in what it is. Um, OK, great. Um, we have a question right over here. Thanks, Al. Um, I've heard some numbers yesterday that I'm still wrapping my head around. How many meetings do you estimate you had with uh, potential investors? 
total or, or at each round? Oh god, I have no idea. I, I couldn't even estimate, I don't know. Uh, I, I would probably, the equation that I would use would be like number of days in a year times average per day and I'm probably pitching at least once a day, sometimes twice-ish um, to somebody at some level. Um, active fundraising is just a beast. You, you're, I mean, I'm currently working probably about 100 hours a week would be my, my guess. Um, but and that's, that's just what fundraising is. It's an entirely new job, plus you've actually got to run your company. Uh, so actually having your like, feet on the ground and executing and then stepping away and having an entirely new job that is a job and a half is, is just the reality of what fundraising is. Um, how many, I don't know. Uh, look, I, I come from the sport world, you get used to losing and you used to get, you get used to have the no all the time. Uh, and you learn to love it and you learn to build momentum every time you're told no and, and just learn to exist in that world and enjoy it. <laughs> so I can tell you exactly in our seed, uh, we raised 1.1 uh, million US dollars and I had 190 no's. <laughs> To get to, I'd, to get to six yeses. You're not Whoa! <laughs> yeah. So I, I remember numbers and I remember the spreadsheet. Uh, and now we're well into that on our um, A. But the a, it's a little different with the A. I've learned how to use this process to learn a ton about ourselves. So the notion of poking holes, the notion of I've heard this question ten times. Um, you know, there are some people out there. I, you know. I, met with someone this morning who was not constructive and it wasn't helpful, but the majority of meetings are. Um, and I actually, as soon as I get out of a meeting, send all that feedback to the relevant people on my team. Um, so, so I do feel the seed process was really hard on me. I, I wasn't good at no, but now I'm actually learning from this. And I like fast no's as well. If it's not a fit, you move on. Um, so it's a lot. And it is important to ask that question because I think new people that come in are like, oh my gosh, I've got 50 no's, maybe this isn't a viable business. That is not the case. The, I think the good news is that uh, if you're successful, then the second company you have, it's a lot quicker, right? Once you have one under your belt, then you can, you can uh, not have that, but probably just you know, have, a, have a handful. Other question. Hi, you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me for my French accent. But uh, how, as a Bluetooth member and inventor, can I find the right investors with the right expertise uh, willing to implement AI into my technologies that I did it already, a uh, patent and everything? So that, did you? I know it might be a surprising question. So, I know. so as, as an inventor, you already have something? You're like, how do you attract investors that will help infuse AI into yeah, what Yeah, exactly. Built? I have a lot of investors in, approaching me, but they are not, um, they don't have the right expertise to help me to go the right way. That's how I'm feeling. But hearing you guys is being helpful and um, inspiring because I just want to. Uh, it's, it's going fast, it's accelerating my things, but I feel like there's something that is not going the right way. And my, it's, it might be my inventor and creativity in mind, but um, I know I have a good technology and it's new and it's coming out. And uh, I would like, honestly, to implement AI into it, but I, I'm seeking to find the right investor. So it's, it's basically more complicated for me since I'm, I'm located in a small town and everything. Um, yeah, I would just look at people's past investments. That's what I did when I was picking which partners to meet with. Um, so just see what companies they've invested in, if it's, if it's similar to yours in your space, but not too similar, um, because then the, <laughs> they're a competitor and you're yeah. telling their investor what you're going to do. Um, so yeah, I would just look at that, and then I think also um, it's great that investors are coming to you. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you're getting that done, but that's awesome. Um, and I think if you write more about what it is you're working on um, and put it out there, like I wrote a TechCrunch article about chatbots like right before the hype cycle started, and that pulled a lot of investors to me who were like, what is this market? I want to know how it works. So write about what you're working on, um, and that will make people come to you. 
I, I would. I, I have a ton of questions, but um, the so do you have a business person on your on your team or a lead of some sort looking at the market and the application, or are you are you in it? Are you the the, the show? Yeah, I, I'm mostly in it. Yes, but I'm. Uh, I have uh, in someone uh, who's working for Silex. Uh, she's helping me to build a, a stronger uh, communication plan. Yeah. Uh, but other than that, it's kind of. Because. Uh, Look, you, you may be an anomaly, and I hope you are. Um, what? Sorry? You may be an anomaly. You may be an unbelievable founder, inventor, business person, salesperson, marketer, like just, yeah, if, <laughs> we're hiring, by the way. Uh, but um, the, it, in my experience, so early on um, when I met Mersan, our co-founder, who was a PhD in computer vision, uh, I met four other PhDs across at various universities and went to them and pitched the whole thing. We're bringing investors, we're doing this. We're, and in the end of, of all four of those, our co-founder just ended up being the one that was like the right fit for me. Um, any investor who would have gone to any one of those researchers, in my opinion, is, is not an informed investor. Uh, unless you've got an actual, um, you know, a, an application, um, a business plan, a... a I do. No, no, but I mean... Okay, sorry. I'm yeah, no, no, I'm sorry if that came out the wrong way. What I mean is um, if you, if you are um, the three researchers that, that I worked with, all three of them said no to me as well. Oh, okay, okay, I understand um, and, and in all three cases, there wasn't a person strictly dedicated on the business itself. So I would make sure, I would speak to the investors, I would look at your team and make sure that the investors really understand what they're investing in um, would be maybe the, the best piece of advice I could give in, in that situation. All right, thank you so much. If, if I may, it sounds to me like what you need first is a collaborator as opposed to an investor, like somebody that can help yeah. to look at it from a technical point of view to see what will this product look like with AI, and then, if that makes sense with your market positioning, then you can go seek funding. But normally it wouldn't be an investor that would say, I think I want to come bring some AI to your, to your invention. It seems like there's missing yeah, a step right, there. Yeah, you're right, I guess, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll think That's about it. That's why I open with I have so many questions. But if yeah. you want to chat later, I'm in. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. <laughs> um, okay, so we have uh, just two minutes left. So I think what I will ask is if you can sum it up, if like what is the, the one piece of advice, how you would summarize uh, to give to people that are in whatever stage they are of the fundraising process, uh, what would that be? I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, make sure to look at every form of capital out there before you get, give up equity. Ensure that that is really what you need to do um, and or uh, raise what you need, not, not more so then. And so um, I think there, in this day and time, if you're in AI and machine learning, and I wouldn't say this to all industries, Look at all the other opportunities out there. I mean, you've heard all three of us before we raised, do you have any, and you didn't, um, found a lot of non-dilutive capital. So I highly, highly recommend to look at all forms of funding before you give up equity in time. I would just say resilience. It's really hard. I think I'm going to say the same thing as you, basically. But there's more than one way to do a thing. And coming from San Francisco, especially in Silicon Valley, like you can get caught up in this like kind of toxic hamster wheel of this is the only way that things work. Um, and it is really hard. Like bootstrapping has definitely taken years off my life. I'm not sure if I would recommend it to ev anyone. Um, we might end up taking a bunch of money. You know, we've lost three engineers to Facebook who can pay four or five times what like a, a person should pay another human. It's just not fair. Um, so it's really hard, but just don't give up ever. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. The best advice I ever got in university was one of, one of this great professor who said, don't ever take advice from anybody. Uh, and, I, and I think the... That's good advice, too. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's so funny because the, you're, you're, you would have said, you know, hold off and maybe, um, or don't bootstrap. I would have said maybe bootstrap a little longer. So it really depends on who you speak with and what the situation is. Um, you know, the longer you go down the line and you can make the thing work, the more your value is going to be up and the less dilutive that cash is going to be, unless you're somehow a ninja and you find non-dilutive cash, um, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's surround yourself with smart people, with good people, be creative, make sure you're getting advice. Uh, that is the only thing with fundraising. There's a lot of really smart people on the other side of the table. Surround yourself with smart people on your side. Thank you so much to all three of you. I will start giving a hand to everybody for giving their time.
And of course, if you have uh, further questions, everyone's going to be you know, at the festival, and you have everybody's uh, Twitter IDs as well uh, on the screen. So uh, feel free to reach out for more questions. Thank you.